This video is brought to you by Nebula. Today, Russia warns the UK about nukes. The EU discusses enlargement. The Catalan leader gives Petro Sanchez an ultimatum, and oil prices soar. From TLDR News, this is your daily briefing for Wednesday, the 6th of September, 2023. On Tuesday, Russia warned the UK that it would treat any US move to station nuclear weapons in the UK for the first time in 15 years as an escalation, after reports in the British press that the two countries were considering it. The story was most recently reported in The Telegraph, which claimed last week that it had obtained access to official documents from the US Air Force requesting a $50 million surety dormitory, which is US military parlance for a nuclear storage site, at the RAF Lakenheath base in Suffolk. For context, RAF Lakenheath was chosen as one of the three sites for US nuclear weapons at the height of the Cold War in 1954. But the last US nukes were withdrawn from the base in 2008 by Obama, in part because the base was subject to regular protests by anti-nuclear protesters. Both the US Air Force and the UK Ministry of Defence have, unsurprisingly, so far refused to comment. But this isn't the first time that these sorts of reports have surfaced. In May of last year, a few months after Russia's invasion began, and about a year after Boris Johnson announced plans to expand the UK's own Trident nuclear programme, The Independent suggested this might be on the cards, pointing to the fact that the Biden administration's defence budget included the UK on a list of countries where, quote, special weapon storage sites were being upgraded. Despite the fact that Russia has engaged in a fair bit of public nuclear sabre-rattling since the war began, the Kremlin came out on the offensive, with Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova warning that such a move would, quote, be treated as an escalation. Zakharova also accused the United States and NATO of moving to an openly confrontational course of inflicting a strategic defeat on Russia, and warned that Russia would be forced to take, quote, compensating countermeasures. Luckily for anyone who wants to avoid a nuclear war, chances are that this is just more empty rhetoric from the Kremlin, who have made multiple nuclear-related threats in the past 18 months. But even still, the return of regular nuclear sabre-rattling is still a worrying development. There's more on the way, but be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to make the daily briefing part of your daily routine, or just search for us on your podcast app to listen along. On Wednesday, Politico reported that French Europe Minister Laurence Boone had told Politico that the European Union should prepare to admit as many as eight new members to push back against Russian influence on the continent. While Boone didn't explicitly name the countries, she was most likely referring to Ukraine, Moldova and the six Balkan countries, five of which, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, Albania and Bosnia and Herzegovina, have received candidate status, which Kosovo applied for in December of last year. This marks a remarkable volte face from the French. Only a couple of years ago, Macron put Albania and North Macedonia's accession talks on hold, arguing that the EU was suffering from enlargement fatigue and that it needed to be reformed before any more countries were admitted. Nonetheless, even with French support, there's no guarantees that the EU will expand anytime soon. Ukrainian accession, which seems to be the priority, will be difficult. Ukraine is an enormous country, and its accession would require significant changes to the common agricultural policy. This is quickly becoming a point of contention within the EU. When European Council President Charles Michel said in a speech last week that the EU should aim to welcome new members by 2030, the European Commission pushed back, saying that accession remains merit-based. Nonetheless, the fact that this discussion is even happening is evidence that the EU is taking its geopolitical responsibilities more seriously. And it'll be interesting to see what happens next. So that's what's been happening in the EU today. Let's move and discuss what's been happening in relation to Spain. The Catalan separatist leader, Carles Puigdemont, has today asked for an amnesty on him as a condition of support for the left-wing coalition government led by Pedro Sánchez. Speaking about why this amnesty is a red line for him, Puigdemont said that October the 1st, the date of the Catalan independence referendum in 2017, was not a crime, nor was the Declaration of Independence and the massive protests against the repression and the ruling of the Supreme Court. Puigdemont is now in a unique position as effective kingmaker following Spain's election. His Junts party holds seven seats in Parliament, a number that could be crucial for Sanchez to reach the 176 necessary in order to form a government. 
If neither of the main parties, Sanchez's PSOE or the opposition Partido Popular Party, manage to find enough seats to form a government, then a fresh election could end up being held in January of next year. This is why an agreement is so crucial. Things are looking good right now for Puigdemont, as Yolanda Diaz travelled to Brussels to meet the exiled Puigdemont. After the meeting, Diaz made clear that they would consider Puigdemont's offer. Oil prices, as measured by the Brent crude benchmark, reached a year high of $90 per barrel on Tuesday, having risen relatively consistently from their recent low of about $70 in July. The rise was a symptom of both low supply and stronger than expected demand. On the supply front, Saudi Arabia had been deliberately producing less oil than it can for some months now to keep prices high. And despite the fact that Russia is currently selling its oil at a significant discount, in July the Kremlin announced that it would be joining Saudi Arabia in its cuts. On the demand side, demand has been higher than expected because, despite its economic woes, China is still consuming a lot of oil, and American demand is currently at a 16-year high, which is less of a surprise given the American economy's strong performance and the renewed focus on domestic manufacturing. All in all, this is a worrying development for any oil-importing countries, especially those in the West. The fact that the Saudis have continued their voluntary cut is conclusive proof that they want to keep oil prices high for the foreseeable future, presumably to guarantee revenue for Mohammed bin Salman's ambitious Vision 2030 programme, and these high prices threaten to undermine post-pandemic and post-war recovery, especially in Europe. In the final uplifting story today, we discuss solar power in Europe. In an update from Politico this week, it's been shown that, thanks to a massive boost in solar power, most EU countries will hit their 2030 renewable energy targets ahead of time. In total, in 2022, the EU added 41 gigawatts of new solar capacity, which is a huge 40% increase from 2021. This is meant to rise yet again by over 50 gigawatts this year. That's not all either. There are other ongoing stories around the world that don't always come up in our daily briefing. For example, the ongoing global fertility crisis, which we actually discussed in the daily discussion. There, Rory and Zach sat down to discuss the intricacies of this crisis, to help us better understand what's really going on. In fact, we release these daily discussions, <laughs> well, daily, covering a huge variety of topics in a more analytical and detailed way than is possible in these main videos. The entire series is available exclusively on our streaming service Nebula. If you've been thinking about signing up, then I have some good news. For a limited time, we're offering lifetime memberships. Yep, if you sign up for a lifetime membership, you get access for as long as both you and Nebula exist. Plus, you're also funding new original content from your favourite creators. In fact, if you sign up using our link, then a third of that money goes straight to us, and the rest goes into the pool to develop new Nebula originals with bigger budgets and better production. Now, it's clearly a lot of money, and honestly, the best value plan is still the annual one. But if you really want to support independent creators and help us make even bigger projects, then this is the best option. Again, do make sure you use our link so that they know that you're supporting TLDR. And also, this offer only lasts until the end of the month, with no guarantee it'll ever be offered again. So, if you're interested, this is your opportunity. Anyway, thanks for your support and for signing up to Nebula.